Hello, and welcome to Distanced Isolation Divertimenti, Chumley Call Society's answer to a lack of rehearsals. This week, my isolated guest is Janine, our wonderful chair. Hello, Janine. Hello, Will. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you so much for asking me, as I always say at the beginning of Desert Island, this, to do this. <laughs> so, uh, what have you got planned for today? Right, I'll go and listen to the birds in the garden, because we've got, according to Charles, my son, for those who might listen to this who don't know, we've got blue grey and coal tips and robins and magpies and blackbirds and pigeons and a squirrel that steals their food. <laughs> then we've had, thanks to Eloise, she told me about a greengrocer called Greens in Highgate, and it will deliver you a pot of anything, just what they choose, what they've got left over. They're all these wonderful vegetables. Oh, marvellous. What have you got? Come from Greece. We've got aubergine, we've got courgettes, we've got something I think maybe what we could use to call an ugly fruit. It's maybe a pink grapefruit. <laughs> Kale, which I think we will crisp up in the oven. So it might be Imam Bailey with the aubergine. It might be kale. One or other of us will. We'll talk about it and one or other of us will cook it. There's some Easter music and hymns from King's College that we haven't yet listened to. We need to clear up the Easter decoration. And then reading, composing quiz questions, which have got bigger. They've gone out to a whole lot of other people. So I keep getting demands for answers. Oh, good. Does that make it more competitive for us then as we have, we have more to compete against? If people choose to submit it. Yeah. Now, John is still top because he got more or less 100%. Then I might try to do something about recording the song, but I don't know how that will go, the Rose, Rose, Rose one. Yeah. Oh, good luck. Uh, thank you. It's like Christmas, because deliveries keep coming. This is the way we're living at the moment, so you never know what will, who will come knocking at the door with a pass. Yeah, it's quite exciting now, isn't it? There is a it is very slightly exciting. Christmas exhilaration about it. Yes, precisely. And that's it, reading as much as possible. Because I was going to ask you, you know, what, what did you get to at the weekend? But I'm finding it very difficult to differentiate between the weekend and the yeah. weekdays at the moment. So have you got a way of making a distinction? or? Well, weekend, we can... there's Dear Father Tony at St Edward's, the Catholic Church, has recorded Mass. So you sit down and watch that, have a bit of a sing-along with the director of music. Anyway, that is what makes Sundays routine. No, we stay a disgraceful length of time in bed. I've got up early specially for this. <laughs> One of my friends said, this is odd because it just feels normal. <laughs> Jeez, where is she in Notting Hill? For us who are not working anymore, it just feels like that. But with more normal deliveries. Normal nice. But with more deliveries. Very good. Okay. Well, let's plough in with your first choice, Janine, is a piece by Claude Debussy. His yeah. prelude à l'après-midi d'enfant, which Very is... Good. An afternoon, <laughs> thank you. An afternoon as as a form of the form, uh, which yes, is originally a, afternoon. which is a piece by Debussy based on the poem by Stéphane Malarmé. Malarmé, yeah. So tell us okay. a little bit about this choice. The first music I think I ever heard was the late great Johnny Cash Ghost Riders in the Sky with my brother singing along. <laughs> it, it, so I don't think I decided not to go with that. Then later on, we had, I learned to play the record player myself. And you had to be careful because 78 discs in those days easily broke. But I found my dad had bought a case full of old 78s from someone. And that included this shortish piece of music on four different 78s. And so I would play these and think, this is like our garden. This is a very, very boring suburb, a semi-detached house with too many people living in it, but oddly when I was a child, a very big garden. They were built, those houses, with gardens this size. And I just loved it. This was my place. This is where I always was. And I thought playing this, that the fawn, the Greek fawn, it's not a Bambi fawn, of course, was the spirit of the garden. And that this was where all the magical things happened. And I didn't realise it was a terribly sensuous piece. In effect, what is happening is he's lusting after a lot of nymphs in the woods. <laughs> if you listen to the music, it actually works up to a positively orgasmic end and then dies down again. It really... But I, as a little girl, just thought, but this is lovely, I like this. It's all about when you get excited and you go to the end of the garden and see where the squirrels are hiding. <laughs> 
Well, I just stood on it. I played it again and again and again to the point where the 78s, one, somebody broke one of them and I had to have a replacement. Anyway, I was all that, but it stayed with me because I then became a classicist, of course, and I learned all about the daimones, the presences in the forest, everywhere in the countryside in Greece. They just personify what's there, that strange, magical feeling of Greece. And a fawn is one of them. And then my mum had decided I was so pathologically shy, I had to have dancing lessons, ballet lessons. I couldn't dance, but I did get interested. So this was also the music for the dance by the great Nijinsky. Right. And he, he danced the fawn, a real, real sort of figure of Russian ballet, legendary. He danced the fawn and got into trouble because he did dance it rather suggestively. It caused shock horror in the paper. And only at this point do I realise, oh God, this is about something else. I didn't realise. So it's that. It's sort of several layers to it. It's the dance, it's classics, it's the magic of the garden. I think. Absolutely. So when you listen to it now, does it take you back to, uh, to that garden of a semi-detached house you're in as a child? Mostly the garden, because it was so utterly amazing, but then it will always, it has those other two resonances as well, I suppose. The classical aspect of it, because this is the presence, this is Greece, this is one of the things that drew me to classics in the first place. I think that's very interesting that the garden or the land that you imagine would be your garden or somewhere you've been, because I don't know if Debussy went to Greece, I'll, I'll research that, but presumably he was inspired by his own idea of Arcadian hills and countryside and things like that. Yes, undoubtedly. Yes, everyone superimposes their own early experience on Greece. There is that idea of Greece where Arcadia varies from one person to another, as you say. So the next piece featured um, on the first of your inventive and engaging quizzes with its wonderful trombone opening, the oh, yeah. very distinctive Tuba Mirum from Mozart's Requiem. So tell us a little bit about this choice. Well, again, <laughs> it's another phase in my life. I was lucky. Not everyone can get this. I had the first year at university, Golden Summer. So I was 20. And I hadn't sung any choral works at all before. I didn't even know that I could sing at all. And a group of us from Newnham College got friendly with a group of men from St. John's. In those days, it was just a men's college. And we were all involved in singing the Mozart Requiem at the Great St. Mary's and rehearsing it. And I'd never done anything like this before. It was just amazing. So, of course, the tuba Mirum comes from the Mozart Requiem. We were in a punt. All of us must have been in this punt. God, it must have been a big punt. And these men from St. John's all had very resonant names. I can still remember the names. Steve Brio, <laughs> Vivian Bazalgette, 
one of the few male Vivians, Paddy Salmon and John Jenkins and Nigel Crisp. Now that, later on that summer, trying to climb out of St John's after hours, I fell into the Bin Brook and I couldn't swim. So Nigel Crisp actually saved me and later on became head of the NHS. So he's obviously wow. a great healer. Now, anyway, we are punting along with all these people and under a bridge, Steve, no, it was Paddy. Paddy Salmon decided to break into the Tubar Miru, very resonant under the bridge. It just sounded wonderful. I thought, this is great thing that we're singing. We are so lucky, but he, he had his eye off the punting pole. So a minute later, somebody else, I have to say, I was a lot, lot slimmer then. People in another punt tried to pull me into theirs. And it took the combined forces of all these men from St. John's and the Newnham people to pull me back in. Otherwise, God knows what would have happened. Everything about it was wonderful, sort of summer romance with one of them. First May ball, you look back on it and think, oh, it was so sweet. And after we'd sung the Requiem, we were on a real high. And I'd never done anything like that before. And I always remember it for that reason. And also we sang it, I think maybe a couple of times with the CCS. And then I've now got this goddaughter called Katie because times are more, less sexist. Katie was at St. John's. So it's all those things. It's Katie and the fact that things changed and that she was well. This is where I got very emotional last summer. She was able to marry her lady partner Cara, and that all went so beautifully well. So it's a great mass of different memories. The choir and that golden summer and Katie. Next up, Janine, we have the Pavan La Bataille by Tiamen Cesarte, yeah. uh, the 15th century Renaissance or 16th century Renaissance composer. And yeah. I always think that with a name like Pavan La Bataille, it sounds a lot more ferocious than it ends up. Being. Yes. This was part of our wedding music. We both like Renaissance dance music. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stuff you get to thinking. What shall we have played at our wedding? And up comes all the old hackneyed, here comes the bride. And so no, 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 no. So we thought about this. I was wearing a gold Renaissance style dress anyway. So this all went together. And Pavan La Bataille, we've got this record of Tielman Cesato, listen to all of it. And this is the ideal recessional, it's full of energy. Yeah. yeah sort of high notes of hope and you're coming out feeling really exhilarated. The other one was Grand Mon Ami, and I think I may have told you this caused some problems because we had to have it transposed for organ. And I was working in St Albans at the time, and the son of the secretary of the school, 17, was the only one who could do this transposition from the record to the organ. It was perfect. So I know De Morto Isnil Nisi Bonham, et cetera, but the late great Stephen Clearbury was working there then. I rang him up to make sure the music was all right. And he said, I don't know, I don't care. You'll get what you get. It can be, here comes the bride. So I sat and cried for about an hour. Thankfully, my mum was still there. 
and the relief for all I care, he said, the relief in getting actually to the church and getting the right music was incredible. I think it added to the exhilaration. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. So it's a very good recessional, very good indeed. And I've got this train of little bridesmaids behind me so they could bounce along to that. I can just see that sort of rectangle of light at the end. We had a long walk because we married in a cathedral. It needed to be something that would take us right through. <laughs> and this long walk and getting closer and closer and outside all these girls from my form who had gathered without telling me and hurled confetti at us. Well, Pavan, it's like the dance, the lifelong dance of love, really. And Bataille, that's a sort of contramundum idea. You know, it's us against the world. Having said that, the world has been pretty nice to us, really. <laughs> It has been said in the past by those who have been isolated in close proximity with others, such as those on Antarctic research bases and astronauts on space station sojourns, that one's stronger personality traits come to the fore quite quickly in isolation. Have you found in lockdown that that's true of you or have any new traits developed? Oh, well, I'm what the French call a soupe au lait. That is when you put milk on top of the oven. And it looks quite calm and it suddenly flares up and the whole thing boils <laughs> out over the oven. This is people who will suddenly yell and scream, drama queen and stuff, and it then dies down as quickly as it started. So that might have been a bit more in evidence, but on the other hand, I've been more aware of it. So I've probably been doing more about trying to get it under control. <laughs> yeah, I can't think that I've developed any new characteristics. It's just the old one of scream. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, your final choice of music is Praise to the Holiest from Elgar's Dream of Gerontius. It's hard to pick a one moment from that really quite epic work. What is it about the Praise to the Holiest that, that makes it stand out for you? Because these are Newman's words. Newman wrote this not long after he'd converted to Catholicism, I think. And he hadn't been well. And they're very powerful words. All the settings... The other settings I find rather pathetic, sort of. They don't carry the force of his words very well. This is the only one for me. It's a chorus of angelicals, of course, and they are there as the soul of Gerontius enters. Yes, and it's a kind of fugue, isn't it? We, it's actually, again, actually singing it is a tremendous experience. When did you which first I've sing done it? A couple of times. Uh, Francis Holland's school where I work, various members of staff who would go along. And I've now sung this twice with Harrow and rehearsing at the school with the FHS girls. So again, it's an experience that reminds me also of my job. But then again, I'm only a sort of Catholic. I'm not a devout Catholic in any sense. I just see it as a channel and there have been the people from the church, the musicians from the church have been absolutely lovely to us. They've been shopping for us. They just prove what being a Christian is supposed to mean. Let's do it. I find it very spiritual, very transcendent. The whole passage, every time, recently, someone I know has passed on, I have played, played it. And recently, it's two weeks ago exactly, on Wednesday, we two weeks ago, that our old parish priest, Father John Helm, died. Now, this was a really beautiful death. He had been 
58 years before he had become, he'd been ordained. It was the anniversary. So this is how his morning went. His friend Ruth, who always looked after him, came round to see him. He said mass, I presume in bed, because a Catholic priest has to say mass every day, of course. And then Easter music was played to him, recorded, I think, by Mary and Peter from the choir. And then the cardinal rang him up because he knew it was the 58th anniversary of his ordination. This is at half past one. And at two o'clock he died. The most amazing death, and he was the best parish priest I ever, ever knew. He would do everything himself. You'd find him up a ladder, sort of sorting out the roof on his own. And he cared about everybody. And I pinched his sermons half the time because they were such good sermons. I would use them for assemblies. He was just wonderful. If you tried to say to him, you're the best parish priest I ever knew, he would just wave it away. He was terribly unassuming. Anyway, that was him. And I rather hope Newman is up there somewhere with him. So I'd like to dedicate that one to him, to Father John. <laughs> So we then came on to the end, I suppose, where I ask you about how you'll survive. I was going to say on the island, but really how you're surviving in isolation seems, seems more apt. I have to know, I suppose I have to ask you, first of all, about reading material. If, if you had to get, to get rid of all of your books in isolation, Jane, what, is, what book would you be left with? Right. <laughs> we would never get to the end. These books are what hold the house up. If they're removed, the house crumbles and smashes <laughs> to the ground. The one that I would like, it's strange, it's Molesworth by Geoffrey Williams. Williams and Ronald Searle, you ever heard of this thing? Yeah. Molesworth. It's very, very, very funny. Now, Ronald Searle, of course, was a great illustrator. He illustrated the St. Trinian's books. And Geoffrey Williams has written this fantastic text. It's a collection of four books, so you never get tired of them. It's a public school boy at a preparatory school called Nigel Molesworth. And he is very, he can't spell. So everything is written down in this crazy spelling. He has his best friend. He has the school prefect. There is the school pig, the school cat, all sorts of things. And it's just a sort of biting social commentary at the same time. First read it when I was about eight. And again, I thought, I love this. I don't know what it's about. It's very funny. It's a little bit like the boys at school, actually. Then later on, it became a sort of far day make or a kind of instruction manual for bringing up a public British public school boy. Oneself. I thought, oh, that's why that happens. That's what it means. And so... And just because it's hilarious, I'd never get tired of it. And because it's an omnibus, it's a cheap. It's got four books in one. Oh, wonderful. I'm oh, going to have to go and order it right now. Well, it just keeps making you laugh. He could never spell have with an E in the end, for example. It's just H-A-V. <laughs> and finally, Janine, in our isolation, I suppose it's this sort of idea of isolation where you're you're shipped off to a sort of a, a, a empty padded room really, isn't it? But uh, what would your luxury item be? Oh, well, I can't. I know from Desert Island, if I can't take my husband, so that's no good. I might get a long distance delivery 
very long distance. If we imagine it is the sort of palm fringed island. And this is from a Thai restaurant in Stafford. That, this is a Thai chef who looks like an absolute dream. You cannot believe it. I might choose to have that shipped to me, but then I think that won't work. So in the end, I'm trying to get three for the price of one. Here. It would be a crate, a sort of French crate, which would have to contain lots of French perfumes because I got that from mother. I can't spend a day without putting perfume on, I'm afraid. French unusual drinks, aperitifs like Lille, um, what else we have, Saint Raphael, Ambassadeur, things you can't get in this country. And lots of garlic, because I can't live without garlic either, and it's proving a little hard to get it at the moment. So that would be in the luxury. Oh, what did I say? I meant to say that Elgar always said about Gerontius, this is the best of me, and I think it really is. I quite agree. That was Elgar's opinion. Well, now, oh yes, it was how I would cope, I suppose. So. I am resourceful, but I'm not practical, so I would need a passing mermaid to stop. Or, failing the mermaid, I would have to train some animals to help me, whatever the animal life was. But other than that, because I don't mind, I like being on my own, I think I'd cope quite well from that point of view. Yeah, no, I think I'm, I'm in your camp there, very much so. Thank you very much, Janine, for being our castaway or our, our isolee. And we'll end this episode listening yeah. to a little more of Elgar's Dream of Drontius and the end of his praise to the holiest. <laughs>